so I, I thought I'd just uh, start this talk by saying, uh, by reassuring comrades that you don't actually need to change the world at all, because uh, reality doesn't actually exist. Um, not my thought, but uh, the thought of uh, some popular science journalists uh, this past couple of weeks writing about the uh, the latest Nobel Prize winners in, in physics, um, who they claim have disproved reality. Now, what these scientists have actually shown is uh, something astonishing enough, but it's a little bit more humble than disproving the idea that reality exists. They have uh, uh, practically demonstrated uh, theoretical ideas about how uh, what we think of cause and effect as being something that operates on a local basis, but at the quantum level, um, what we call quantum entanglement, cause and effect is capable of operating over very long distances. Certainly, it, it, it violates uh, common sense, but uh, the, uh, the Nobel Prize Committee themselves actually um, uh, garbled this a little bit in their explanation of what these scientists have discovered to the effect uh, of, of explaining that these scientists had in fact uh, proven that cause and effect does not really exist. Um, and therefore, presumably, the world merely exists as a haze of probabilities um, until, well, until we observe it, uh, presumably, um, at which point, uh, um, you know, you can see how the idea that there is no cause and effect opens the door to uh, philosophical idealism and mysticism. And this was, the, this was the conclusion precisely drawn by some of the, uh, the popular science blogs, such as The Big Think, who took this Nobel Prize committee, uh, this Nobel Prize uh, announcement, and uh, took from it that an objective reality devoid of the actions of an, of an observer does not appear to exist in any sort of fundamental way. This is the conclusion that they've drawn. So imagine that, you know, by experimentation in a material laboratory using a material apparatus, scientists have disproven that there is such a thing as cause and effect at the quantum level. And they've in fact disproven that there is even an objective material world independent of the observer. So, uh, you know, these are, uh, uh, um, Suffice it to say, I'll come back to quantum mechanics in a bit, but this is a misrepresentation, in fact, of the science. And in actual fact, it's, uh, it's complete and utter mysticism. Um, it's, uh, it's, it, these are reactionary philosophical ideas, ideas that belong in the pre-scientific age, in actual fact, that are being dressed up in what Lenin referred to as the tinsel of modern science. This has been used to, 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 to smuggle these ideas in. And it's not just amongst popular science journalists that you see these ideas being repeated. You see serious scientists actually repeating these sort of ideas, as I'll come on to explain. Um, and I think the fact that you see this mysticism, and, and there, this is what I'm, we're talking about, basically, mysticism um, seeping even into the sciences is a morbid symptom of the decay of culture under a decaying capitalist system. Now, comrades, we often, and, and many times over this weekend, we, you would have heard the, the phrase crisis of capitalism, uh, uh, the decay of capitalism. But do we fully appreciate what it means for a system under which we live every hour of our waking lives uh, to be in, a, to be in an ex a crisis, basically? What does that mean for ordinary people? Um, well, I just wanted to tell you to start with a brief story of a, a comrade that I had an interaction with over Zoom in 2020, like most interactions at that time, uh, who's a molecular biologist. And uh, uh, this comrade was explaining to me how them and their research team were, were trying to find the genes in certain species of cows uh, in Africa um, that allow them to generate milk at high ambient temperatures. And when they identified those genes, they wanted to find a way to splice them in the, in, into the genetic uh, uh, code of the cows that are used in the majority of the dairy industry. Why? In order to prevent us losing the dairy industry as a result of the catastrophic uh, climate destruction that capitalism is wreaking on the world. Uh, the reason I mention this is because basically the most brilliant minds, uh, you know, scientists with, with degrees and everything, um, are, are not being used, are not using their minds to advance human culture. They're using their, 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 the best of their intelligence to prevent us from being thrown back, not hundreds of years, but to a time before the even, I mean, dairy farming goes back 10,000 years. It's a discovery uh, that, that belongs to the early Neolithic, and uh, it's under threat in, in large parts of the world because of, because of capitalism. Um, I raise this story because um, people take meaning in their daily lives from uh, contributing to the community, to the society around us, to in some small way, personally, professionally, whatever, advancing society. But um, this system, in its decay, threatens to not just wipe out the, 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 uh, uh, the contributions of this generation, but even long dead generations are threatened by the, the throwback to barbarism that this puts on the, uh, on the order of the day. And therefore, the only way, in my opinion, to achieve a, a meaningful, purposeful existence under this decaying capitalist system 
is to fight tooth and nail for its destruction, to fight for its overthrow. Um, there is no other way. But the, uh, the ruling class, of course, they completely, uh, they completely 100% identify themselves with this system, but they too can sense that it is in a crisis, that it has no future. Um, but unable to, to, to conceive of any other alternative system, they are increasingly inclined to turn away from reality. And they therefore become the source of all kinds of mysticism and moods of despair that trickle down into society through the media, through the universities, and uh, uh, we, we see this in, in philosophy departments in universities, for example. There's other talks this weekend, I'm sure, that have touched upon it, of the rise of postmodernism, which fundamentally denies the knowability of the world. Grand, grand narratives, overarching explanations of an objective reality. We only have the subjective reality in our head, so to speak. It denies precisely the possibility of reason unlocking the, an explanation about the world. But we see the same thing also in the science departments at universities. The contradiction here is that the very purpose of science is precisely to uphold the claims of reason to be able to understand the world, to push back the frontiers of our ignorance. And uh, consciously or unconsciously, all science is fundamentally incompatible with mysticism, um, it premises itself on the idea that there is a material world that exists objectively out there, that it can be known, um, and that we will know more about it tomorrow than we do today. Um, and therefore, where we see this creeping mysticism within the sciences, it goes under a false banner of actually defending science, of even being genuine science. And, and we should therefore, it, it, it's all the more pernicious, pernicious for precisely that reason. Before I go on to talk a little bit more about quantum mechanics, I should say a couple of things about uh, philosophy. Um, since, uh, well, for millennia, um, since its inception, philosophy has fundamentally been divided into two antagonistic camps. There is the materialist camp, and we as Marxists belong to the camp of the materialists. And we, and, and we materialists simply uh, states that matter exists independently of mind. It was uncreated, it is its own cause, whereas mind, on the contrary, is not independent of matter, but rather is one of the qualities of matter organized in a certain way in the human brain. Uh, the result, the product of billions of years of evolution of matter. Now, uh, I, you can, uh, idealists, on the other hand, and that's the other great camp within philosophy, state that on the contrary, it's mind, that be it the, the mind of man or the mind of God, which is primary and independent. And matter, if it exists, and there are idealists who deny that there is a material world out there, is merely secondary and, and dependent upon mind. I think it's quite clear to see how idealism forms the starting point of all mysticism uh, uh, and religious conceptions, whereas uh, materialism uh, is the necessary philosophical starting point of, of good science, uh, fundamentally. Um, but since the, um, since the early 20th century in particular, um, a philosophical trend, uh, which referred to as positivism, has tried to subvert the very essence of what it means to do science. Rather, than science discovering, unlocking the, 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 the natural laws of the, uh, the material world that exists out there, the positivists, and there are many shades of positivism, and I don't wish to go to, 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 to sort of have a fine tooth comb and, and go through them, uh, but generally they are united by the idea that rather than trying to find out anything about the world out there, the goal of science is to organize our experience, to bring order to our experience, which fundamentally means um, experience means that the sense impressions within our heads, to describe them lawfully, you know, the, 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 uh, to give them a mathematical description or whatever else, what we see, hear, and, and, uh, and so on. Um, in other words, uh, experience, consciousness, becomes a key part of, of that's, science is about organizing consciousness fundamentally and says nothing about the material world. In fact, it opens the door to denying that the material world exists um, or, doubt, or at the very least doubting that the material world exists, as many positivists uh, in fact do. Um, and I think it's very easy to see this. This is clearly uh, belongs either in the idealist camp or in the sort of inconsistent camp of waverers between materialism and idealism. Now, the, the trailblazer of positivism in, uh, in, in modern science uh, was the late 19th and early 20th century physicist philosopher by the name of Ernst Mach. Uh, you will almost certainly have heard of Ernst Mach. Um, if a, a supersonic jet is going at two or three times the speed of sound, they talk about it going at Mach 2 or Mach 3. Mm -hmm. Um, and I enjoy the irony of the fact that, therefore, indirectly, Mac has given his name to the, uh, the Gillette uh, razor blade series, a very fast sounding uh, word, uh, the, the Mac series of razor blades. The irony being, of course, that Mac, like most um, Austrian and German gentlemen of the late 19th century, had a big beard, so probably never saw a razor blade in his life. 
Um, but uh, more seriously, uh, if you've read the writings of Lenin and his philosophical writings, you will have certainly heard of Mack, because uh, particularly if you've read materialism and imperial criticism, um, Lenin really lays into the, the students, uh, the, or should I say the followers of Mack's ideas in Russia, uh, which numbered uh, members of the Russian Social Democratic Labour Party and the Bolshevik faction were influenced by this anti-materialist trend within philosophy in the wake of the defeat of the 1905 revolution. He, he thought it, he regarded it as a matter of life or death for the existence of the, of, of, of the Marxist tendency in Russia to fight against this, these Maxist ideas, basically, and their penetration into the ranks of the, uh, of the Marxists. This at a time after the defeat of the 1905 revolution, when you had all sorts of despair, mysticism, interest in religious cults and, and the church reviving because of the pessimism that sort of swept the country in the wake of counter-revolution. Um, so uh, you, will, you may well have heard these, uh, these ideas already from there. But, but these, uh, these ideas actually were, were really in vogue in the early 20th century amongst bourgeois intellectual circles, particularly <clears throat> in the German-speaking world. And there's a reason for that. Quite simply, uh, they were a reaction to the growing popularity of Marxist materialism within the, the, the labor movement, within the workers' movement, particularly in the German-speaking world. The, the, this was a, a philosophical reaction, effectively. The, the, the bourgeois were extremely alarmed, uh, and, uh, and this, was the, this was the other side of that uh, equation. And these ideas, they had a big impact. Um, you had the, uh, the rise of... Uh, uh, um, the, uh, the Vienna School of, uh, of, of, of intellectuals in, inspired by positivists, inspired by Ernst Mack at the University of Vienna, but also um, leading, uh, uh, leading physicists, scientists who were involved in that great revolution in science in the early 20th century in quantum mechanics and uh, in relativity. Einstein was even influenced by these ideas for a period, although to his credit, he turned his back on them in favor of a kind of Spinozaist materialism later in his life. But uh, two leading physicists whose names are intimately bound up with the quantum revolution were very influenced by these ideas, uh, Niels Bohr and Werner Heisenberg. And in fact, uh, Bohr even hosted a conference of these Vienna positivists at his uh, Copenhagen mansion in 1935, um, where they presented their views, and he was very sympathetic. And there was one physicist who attended that conference that I want to talk about a little bit about his observations of that, co of that conference later on. But Bohr and Heisenberg, uh, essentially uh, believed that quantum mechanics uh, proved, the, uh, uh, proved their philosoph this philosophy correct, that it was precisely the observer is key to understanding the reality of the world. Um, that, uh, um, that, that effectively, the observer is the one that brings reality into existence. It, they, they, they were effectively idealists, and they had their own interpretation called the Copenhagen Interpretation. Uh, of which there are many interpretations in turn, exactly what they meant. But uh, the reason for this, uh, uh, effectively, what, what they were hooking onto was the fact that quantum mechanics brings to light some very contradictory behavior of matter that we are not uh, used to on this macroscopic level of existence. I've talked about quantum entanglement. The idea of action at a distance is very, uh, very counterintuitive uh, at this level of reality, where that's certainly not what we observe. And uh, uh, in particular, we see at the quantum level a, a very contradictory behavior referred to as wave-particle duality. Um, uh, just to explain a bit about why that, um, why that is so contradictory or, or uh, so counterintuitive. Well, think about a, a, a particle. If, think of a particle as a marble. If you take a marble and you throw it, you can, trace the, you can track where that marble goes through the, through the air, and it only hits one object at a time. It's discrete. It's in a single place. Uh, that's what we mean by it behaves like a particle. It's in a single place at a single time. Now, take that particle and throw it into a still pond, and the ripples will spread out continuously. A, a, a wave doesn't just exist in a single place. It, it spreads out. It's uh, um, <clears throat> like the waves in the ocean. Um, and yet, at the quantum level, things behave both like waves and particles. And this is a little bit of a head scratcher. Um, because, uh, and it leads to some interesting results, such as for the fact that in the famous uh, double slit experiment, um, an electron will arrive at a single place. You only see the electron in a single place when it arrives at a detector. But it arrives in a p position which suggests that on its way there, it has beha behaved in some ways like a wave, which is continuous in space. Um, so how did it get from A to B? Did it, did it spread out? Did it, uh, did it go 
via uh, two trajectories? Did it go via one trajectory? This is the sort of uh, uh, question that has left uh, uh, people interpreting quantum mechanics in various ways. It's not a trivial problem, of course, to solve uh, whatsoever. But the, uh, uh, but the, the manner in which it was solved by the Copenhagen interpretation was to say that actually the particle has no position, it has no momentum, and it has no other properties until the moment that we observe it. Um, which, uh, and, i.e., uh, what, what does it mean to make an observation? Well, that is much debated, but of course it brings in the role of uh, a conscious observer, basically bringing reality into existence. And it's not actually a solution that says that solves anything, because it doesn't actually tell us anything more about what's going on uh, at any deeper level than, this, uh, uh, than what quantum mechanics already tells us. In fact, it actually draws a line in the sand and says there is no deeper level uh, uh, to reality. There is nothing further and deeper to investigate, and therefore science must stop here. Um, it's, uh, but it really tallies with this positivist idea that in fact the role of science is not at all to describe the material reality of the universe, but rather to merely give a description, a mathematical description, to our observations, uh, to our experience, uh, which is what the, uh, the positivists were talking about. So you can see this influence. And it should be said, from the beginning there were those physicists who opposed uh, this idealist drift within the sciences and put forward alternative theories. Uh, Einstein, uh, de Broglie, Schrodinger, uh, later, people like David Bohm and Bell. And uh, uh, yeah, so this, is, this has always been contended, but the reason that this uh, idealist trend has gained the upper hand is it really goes with, the, it goes with the flow of where bourgeois philosophy and thinking is going in general uh, within society and the, this decaying capitalist system. Now, when I say that these ideas, these positivist ideas, were directly inspired by a fear of Marxism, um, I meant that quite literally. And I now want to go back to that 1935 conference, uh, Bohr's Mansion in Copenhagen, where there was a, another pioneer in quantum mechanics called Pas Pasquale Jordan, I believe his name is pronounced, um, who was a defender of positivism pioneer of quantum mechanics, and a member of the Nazi party and an open reactionary. Uh, and he attended this conference and he wrote a report for the Nazi party uh, describing what went on. And I just want to quote that because this is a class conscious reactionary. He said, the modern scientific development and the uneasiness and concern it aroused in the materialistic camp deserves careful observation from a political point of view as well. Um, of course, the defeat of Bolshevism, which is now threateningly raising its head among various neighboring peoples, is primarily a matter of political decision-making and ideological and blood-based fighting power, which cannot be replaced by scientific evidence. Nevertheless, it seems to be a significant sign of the times that the materialistic worldview, viewed as a scientific theory, is being exposed as untenable and contrary to scientific knowledge precisely in those areas of science which since the Renaissance have been considered its safest domain. So, um, in other words, he saw science as a philosophical battleground against Bolshevism, against Marxism, and we should see it as likewise a philosophical battleground for Bolshevism, for Marxism. Um, and uh, we should ignore those, uh, those individuals who claim that Marxists should leave philosophical questions in the science to the scientists. Scientists, for the most part, don't have a conscious philosophy and they will pick up the bits and bobs of philosophy that exists in society, like these positivist ideas, which were attached to a directly uh, uh, um, a reactionary political agenda of these conscious reactionaries at this time, as I say. Um, now, the struggle for these ideas uh, of different interpretations goes on to the present day. There's as many interpretations as there are philosophers of science out there. Um, and uh, you see the same idealist nonsense being revived in different guises time after time. One very famous example, in the 1980s, there was a, a physicist called John Wheeler who proposed the idea that it's not matter which is the fundamental building block of reality. In fact, it's information which sounds you know, very appealing in the, uh, the, the, the age of artificial intelligence and uh, you know, uh, computers and all of this sort of stuff. But like the idea that it's observation or experience, what does it mean to say that it's information which is the fundamental building block of reality? Well, um, uh, just like the idea that experience is fundamental, well, you can't separate experience from that which you're experiencing and the subjective individual that's doing the experiencing. And it's the same with information. You can't separate information from that which is doing the informing and the conscious one that's being informed. In other words, it surreptitiously brings the conscious observer in as a key component of reality. It sort of 
brings these uh, mystical ideas in, in, in very objective sounding language, I'm sure you'll agree, you know, information. It doesn't get much more objective than that. But it makes consciousness a, a fundamental part of reality, opening the door to idealism and mysticism. And mysticism really thrive at the frontier of our ignorance. That's what, it's the god of the gaps that they talked about. You know, in quantum mechanics, it's the frontier at the scale of the very small. But we also see it on the, on the frontier, which is the, the scale of the immeasurably vast. I'm talking about cosmology, of course. Now, a, um, a key difference between materialism and idealism is that for us as materialists, matter being primary and independent um, can have no creator or act of creation. That doesn't go for idealists. For idealists who, who suppose that mind or spirit is primary and prior, um, it quite logically flows that the material universe had some sort of act of world creation and therefore, of course, some sort of world creator, some sort of god. Um, and I think it's a, a stark expression of the crisis, the philosophical crisis in science, um, that cosmology has arrived at a fully-fledged uh, creation myth. And I'm, of course, referring to Big Bang cosmology. Now, uh, at this point, uh, I didn't hear any gasps of uh, shock, but uh, it's sometimes regarded as somewhat uh, of a heresy to, uh, to disagree with the, the, the prevailing cosmology because it's the consensus, the scientific consensus, to which I, I, I have to simply say that uh, scientific truth is not established by consensus. Many things have been the consensus within the scientific establishment that are now no longer regarded as, uh, are regarded as very erroneous, erroneous, like the idea that the Earth was the center of the universe, or that heat is caused by uh, a substance uh, called caloric, which flows through everything, um, some sort of fluid. Um, in the 1920s, it was even the consensus amongst astronomers, and I think this is very significant, that the Milky Way is the only galaxy in the universe, that, right up until the 1920s. Um, and the reason for that is because astronomers could not conceive of a universe so massive as to contain numerous uh, galaxies. Um, and uh, yeah, in fact, the idea of an infinite universe has been something that has always, it, it, it contains a philosophical challenge that astronomers have struggled with uh, uh, time and time again. Now, a little bit about how the specifics of Big Bang cosmology, how it came about. Well, um, when astronomers look into space and they observe light coming from distant galaxies, uh, the, uh, the, the further that light has traveled to us, uh, the longer it, it has traveled. And therefore, the older we are, the, the further back in time we're effectively uh, seeing that galaxy. Cosmologists talk about a look back time. If it's a billion light years away, you see it as it was a billion years ago. And in the 1920s, uh, looking back at these, uh, these distant galaxies, uh, an astronomer by the name of Edwin Hubble um, made an empirical observation about these galaxies. He noted that the further they are away from us, the redder they appear. Um, and this can be physically explained, and this is the prevailing uh, physical explanation at the moment. If these galaxies are regarded as receding from each other at speed, um, it's almost as if we're in the midst of some sort of cosmic explosion, uh, effectively. Now, that was, uh, that was Hubble's observation. But take uh, an idea such as this and push it to its extreme, and it turns into an absurdity. And uh, that's pr precisely what a Belgian astronomer by the name of Georges Lemaitre did in the 1920s. He supposed if all galaxies are moving away from each other at speed, rewind the tape and what do you arrive at? You arrive at a single point, what he called a primeval atom, at which all matter and time and space itself simply came into existence when everything was concentrated at that one point. Physicists today call it a singularity. Everything came from nothing. You have a moment of creation. And we're forbidden from asking what came before, fundamentally. Lemaitre was in no doubt what came before because he was an ordained Catholic priest. It was God which created the universe. Um, now, some at this point may object to me uh, that uh, actually um, it's a straw man to claim that most cosmologists regard the universe as having come into existence with a singularity 13.8 billion years ago. And actually all the Big Bang says is that the universe used to be hot and dense. Um, well, I would respond to that, that many leading physicists do literally believe that the universe came into existence 13.8 billion years ago. Stephen Hawking certainly believed that time started with a singularity and many other, you know, he was a pretty, you know, he was a pretty well-respected man in his field. Uh, and many continue to, to, uh, to this day. Um, now, um, yeah, what the Big Bang, as I mentioned, what the Big Bang confronts astronomers with is that age-old problem of the question of infinity. Now, even our most powerful telescopes can only observe a, a finite fraction of the universe um, 
to understand the infinite and to, to understand the relationship between the finite and the infinite, we have to bring in philosophy. Um, and, we and we understand, as Marxists, that uh, taken to their extreme, things turn into their opposite. Quantity transforms into quality. And any physical law can only approximate to the workings of matter at some finite scale before it breaks down. But in Big Bang cosmology, what we see here is this, this finite em empirical observation is applied to the entire infinite cosmos. The expansion that we see in this moment, in this corner of the universe, is taken as the last word in the whole history of the, you know, this infinite cosmos. Um, there are then sweeping mathematical uh, simplifications are made to how we understand this cosmos in order to fit everything into a singular equation, just to make the maths calcu calculable, not on the basis that we observe these simplifying factors like the idea that the universe is smooth and not lumpy. I mean, all of our, <laughs> all of our experience says the universe is very lumpy, but they assume it's, it's, it's actually it's entirely smooth, because otherwise you can't do the maths to find out what the, how the universe has evolved. We should note at this point that uh, this, this maths uh, and, and uh, the, the kind of uh, construction of, of the Big Bang Theory as it exists today is not the big, what is now called the Lambda Cold Dark Matter model, is, uh, is certainly not the Big Bang Theory that existed in Lemaitre's day. Because quite simply, um, the Big Bang Theory has, not, has repeatedly failed to, to fit in with observations and therefore all sorts of mathematical constructs have been added onto it to force it, to shoehorn it into the observations uh, rather than actually uh, completely reevaluating the theory. So, for example, the idea that 95% of the stuff in reality is, is dark matter and uh, um, dark energy. We've never observed it, but we know it must be there because otherwise the theory doesn't fit the facts. Um, but probably the most egregious and the one I love of all of these is inflation, the, the idea of an inflation field, which says that the universe, uh, very shortly after the so this, this Big Bang, uh, the universe went through a growth spurt in which each nanometer, which is roughly the size of an atom, uh, expanded within a, a little more than an instant to be 10 light years wide, which is a distance kind of between stars. It just went whoosh, just like that. <laughs> Not like that, just like that. Just went, uh, just expanded at... Uh, it's completely unphysical, there's no evidence for it, but they know it must have happened, and all cosmologists swear blind it did happen, because otherwise the, our observations simply contradict uh, the, the, the facts. Take, basically, look at, one, look at the cosmic microwave background radiation. It's a certain temperature, it's 2.5 degrees Kelvin or whatever on that side of the universe, and it's the same temperature on that side of the universe. Um, they're the same temperature, which would suggest in most physics that they were in causal contact with each other. They've been in communication. They know that each other are at that temperature. But there's no way they could have communicated. There's no, uh, unless you invent stuff like the inflation field and this sort of thing to, to make it happen. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's mathematical idealism on the most absurd scale. The problem, however, that Big Bang cosmology faces is the, uh, the further you look back in space, the further you look back in time, and uh, presumably, you see a universe which existed in its, uh, in its kind of like infancy, in its cradle. But, um, and, and what we know, what, we, what, what astronomers suppose the universe looked like uh, uh, at that early time, is that uh, the earliest galaxies would have been very small. They would have been f largely free of dust and heavy metals, which are produced by generations of star formation. Um, and only over time would they have agglomerated into large, mature galaxies. And yet now, of course, the James Webb Telescope is able to bring back images of some of these galaxies, uh, which, if we accept the established cosmology, are only three or four hundred million years old, which sounds like a lot, but in cosmological terms is a mere blink of an eye. And what they find are giant, mature galaxies, rich in dust and metals, uh, the, the kind of galaxies that could never have formed in the allotted time. Um, now, for some, I'm, I've no doubt there will be astronomers and cosmologists who are already, in fact, uh, beginning to question the Big Bang paradigm. But for many others, there are a lot of careers at stake. Uh, there's millions of pounds in research grants. Um, and um, they are tr already trying to come up with mechanisms by which galaxies can form in an instant like that. Uh, they're trying to find some way of making the facts sustain this uh, unsustainable theory. And there, are pre there is a historical precedent for this. Uh, in the 17th century, uh, scientists were starting to look at uh, the, uh, the Earth's history. And they were noticing strata that suggested very different uh, climates and a lot, of different, uh, a lot of change in the Earth's history. Fossils at lower levels that don't exist at high levels suggesting mass extinctions. And yet everyone knew that the universe was only 6,000 years old. Um, <laughs> and they had to invent some way to, uh, the first British catastrophists, uh, it was late, later taken up uh, by some very talented individuals in France, this idea of catastrophism, but the earliest catastrophists 
uh, invoked all kinds of floods and, and meteors to try and make those facts uh, fit in with the creation myth. Now, uh, obviously, uh, the real solution was that the universe, uh, the Earth was actually four and a half billion years old, and I'm sure in time this will become unsustainable for the established cosmology. Now, to come back, uh, come back down to Earth, uh, <laughs> I want to talk about, uh, brief, as, as briefly as I can, I want to address um, a third place where I think that particularly, actually, more recently, you've seen a real penetration of idealism into a, a field of the sciences. Um, and that is, um, particularly in the last 30 years, a real drift in this direction. And that is in the sciences that deal with the relationship between the thinking brain and the body and the, the, the origins of consciousness. Um, the question, of course, really goes to the root of the clash between materialism and idealism as camps within philosophy. The re that relationship between mind and matter is at the centre of that, that antagonism within philosophy. Um, and we, we know, of course, that it is the brain is the seat of, uh, of conscious uh, uh, thought. Um, and we know what the brain is. It's, it's, you know, it's roughly 1.3 kilograms, a little more, a little less for some people. Um, it's <laughs> no, no one in particular, but just, you know, some people. Um, the scientists, maybe even a little more. Um, some of these philosophers, certainly a lot less. Um, uh, it's, it's, it consists of 80 billion uh, neurons, uh, a, a similar number of uh, glial cells, and uh, p perhaps, a th I, I, I was astonished by this number, a thousand trillion synapses, that's the connections between the neurons. It's, uh, it's by far the most complex object that we are familiar with in, in, in the universe. And um, it poses a question, how from this, you know, this pink mass of very complex uh, matter, does the mind and conscious thoughts uh, and, and these sort of phenomena that we associate with conscious thought, how does it emerge? Um, how, does it, how does it occur um, that, this, that this takes place? In addressing this question, and in fact, actually, in really posing the question correctly, we see how important it is to have a philosophy um, and where you can end up if you don't have a, a conscious philosophy as well. Now, difficulties in solving this question uh, really go back to the dawn of the Enlightenment. This is a very old question, the relationship between mind and body. Um, you know, Descartes, for example, uh, regarded nature as fundamentally mechanical. Everything is merely a mechanism, the, the animals, uh, humans, um, and uh, mechanisms uh, are, are merely, you know, with this me me mechanistic view of the universe, everything is merely the sum of its parts, interlocking, you, one thing pushes into another like a piece of clockwork. Um, and uh, there's no real space. If you just see the whole as nothing more than the sum of its parts, there's no space for consciousness within that model. Um, and therefore, Descartes solved this problem, if you can call it a solution, by supposing that uh, the spiritual, uh, the conscious, <coughs> psychical phenomena, uh, uh, phenomena and physical, uh, the physical world and matter exists on two fundamentally different planes. Uh, it was a dualistic solution in which the two, how did the two interact? Well, there was some sort of God organ within the brain for him. And that was, uh, that was the pineal gland. It was a rather arbitrary point uh, in, uh, right in the center of the brain. And uh, that's, how, that's how consciousness gets into the brain, through the pineal gland. Um, now, the, the problems with the mechanistic view of the universe and how that relates to mind and consciousness didn't really stop with, uh, with Descartes. Uh, that, that view prevailed uh, to a large extent in the 19th century, and, and Engels was very critical of this view. You had mechanical materialists in the 19th century arguing that consciousness was something that was produced by the brain in a similar way that the liver produces bile. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, this is, uh, this is how you know, consciousness is like some sort of liquid just emitted by the brain, you know, like an endocrine organ or whatever. Um, it was an ex it's an explanation, in fact, that explains precisely nothing. It's similar to what I talked about before, the old theory that heat is caused by this, this substance that uh, flows throughout the un th through matter called caloric. Uh, it doesn't really tell you anything about what heat is. It just transfers the, the problem to a new substance called caloric, which, uh, which is, doesn't really exist, and therefore you've actually mystis mystis mystified the problem. It transfers it to this new invented uh, substance. And... Um, so it, it, it still remains a problem, basically, uh, in which the, you know, explanations from the outside were invoked because they couldn't find it within the brain itself. Now, since then, of course, in the 20th century in particular, we've delved uh, deep into the brain, uh, yeah, literally and, 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 and metaphorically. We've, uh, we've uncovered a, a great deal about its workings. But by and large, this has taken uh, the form of analyzing uh, the parts or aspects of, of the brain itself. Now, 
Engels actually talks in Socialism, Utopian and Scientific. This is a very important part of science, is to break things down before we can put it together. You know, we have to see, we ha the anatomist has to break things up down, uh, see things in their death and, and put, put them back together and, and, and uh, see how things would have developed in their life. But yeah, the, the, we've, we've analyzed all sorts of things, you know, the role of chemistry, of uh, neurotransmitters, of hormones in the brain's functioning, electrical signals, um, the structures of neurons, how synapses form, uh, how synapses are, are broken, uh, how the brain develops from the embryo through to the, the fully conscious thinking human adult. Um, all of these things we've, that we've made advances in. Uh, but the question of consciousness has been uh, rather neglected. Um, a point that was made um, by uh, a, a guy called uh, Francis Crick in the 1990s, uh, he, was, uh, um, he, he pointed out that consciousness has been essentially neglected within neuroscience and, the, 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 and within the sciences generally. And at that point, Crick in particular, uh, who you, you, may, you may know, he's uh, the co-discoverer of, of DNA. Uh, him and others uh, believed that new technologies like, uh, I'm going to get to say this wrong, magnetoencephalography and uh, MRI were on the cusp of basically solving the problem of consciousness by finding correlations between the activity of the, the magnetic activity of the human brain, these brain waves, and specific conscious thoughts. Um, obviously, he was involved in decoding the, the human genome, uh, de well, finding the structure of DNA, which led to the decoding of the, the genome. Um, and just like uh, each gene uh, encodes a certain protein. He thought each brainwave would be able to tell us something about a, a specific conscious thought. Um, and uh, in particular, there was a lot of hope placed upon the 40 hertz wave that uh, passes through the brain, uh, what we call the gamma wave, uh, which uh, this engendered a lot of hope because it tends to be suppressed when we're asleep or under anesthetic, and therefore this was seen as a, a, a marker of consciousness, basically. But all of those hopes inevitably ended in dis disappointment. And uh, the problem, the, the reason is because it, he, his approach is dogged by the same problem that the question of consciousness has been dogged with uh, throughout uh, the, the history of this. This is a, it's a reductionist uh, uh, kind of mechanical materialist view, reducing consciousness to one thing, this, this, uh, uh, this particular brainwave. Um, and... Uh, but the, pro the problem is you can, you can turn over a synapse or a neuron or a piece of brain tissue or interrogate these 40 hertz um, uh, uh, waves or what have you, and you, you, consciousness will be found lacking. Just to give you an example, uh, when, we, uh, when we memorize things, what they notice is parts of the brain, when we recall a memory, sorry, parts of the brain that were involved in initially processing that were, uh, are once more activated. So those bits of, of, of your brain which are associated with seeing uh, 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 you know, a car crash unfold in front of you, the, all of that sort of stuff, you, re you recall that memory to mind, those same parts of the brain light up. You literally re-experience it, thereby actually transforming the memory itself. And so the way that that memory is stored, of course we know there's a difference between short and long-term memory. Uh, it, it, each time it's recalled, it, it, it uh, is stored in a different way. So therefore the idea that there is a you know, a single thought can be corresponded to a single brainwave. The brain is, a, is, a, is, a, is actually not, a, it's not a, a, hard, a hard disk where you can read the magnetic code, you know, it's not a static thing. It's a process, it's developing. And you need dialectics, you need to see the brain precisely in its development, in its evolution. Um, and the problem with reductionism is that it picks some level of causality within the brain and it reduces consciousness to that. It used to be regarded as a bit like a, you know, uh, a, a piece of wiring like a computer, basically, like a hard disk or something like that. Then you have this idea of brain waves and other things, but uh, fundamentally it's, it's a, a problem with this reductionist approach. And the failure to find a simple one-to-one -one correlation between parts of the brain and conscious thinking has actually led the field into a complete descent into a fractured mess in which mysticism has utterly revived in the most, re <laughs> in the most absurd ways. Um, you have uh, individuals like uh, David Chalmers, who's a, a so-called philosopher, um, who claims that there's no need to, there's no way to, in fact, tell if you are conscious. Uh, I know that I'm conscious, um, but but I can study your psychology, I can study your neurons, I can study everything else without supposing you're conscious. So therefore, I can assume he, he referred to, we can assume that you're all zombies, and I can continue to analyze your the phenomenon of consciousness anyway. It basically dismisses the idea that we even need to address the problem. It's uh, an absurd conclusion. Um, it's clear that consciousness is, a, is a, an extremely uh, important element in human survival and human culture. 
uh, that the passions, the will of human beings, that phenomenon of consciousness, that qualitative phenomenon, uh, deserves uh, inve scientific investigation. That's one approach to, to the question. Um, you have others, like the Nobel Prize winning uh, physicist Roger Penrose. Again, don't, <laughs> a Nobel Prize is, is, uh, is no more certain than a PhD on your wall or what have you to, to, to guarantee that you've got a good philosophy uh, uh, whatsoever or uh, are, not, are not capable of slipping into the most bizarre mysticism. This is Roger Penrose. His idea, uh, what he advocates, is a kind of uh, quantum mysticism, basically. Um, as uh, uh, um, he, he eff effectively attempts to show that formal logic shows that humans you know, are like machines, you know, they, they operate on the, you know, the, the Newtonian kind of level. And uh, if the brain is regarded as a kind of machine, uh, just like a Turing machine, it can't be capable of like flashes of creativity and solving. It, it's basically, uh, how do you get these flashes of creativity? How do you get a f free will in this uh, like uh, brain machine type thing? And he says, well, it has to come from some non-deterministic realm. Uh, he, he, he points to specifically these microtubules, very thin tubes that give the brain synapses their structure and uh, says that quantum effects will have a quite a big impact over those very small tubes. And therefore, quantum mechanics kind of inserts itself by, the, by these quantum tubules. And it's, it's complete mystical woo that is uh, invented to basically, uh, because uh, just, just like basically Descartes, for Descartes, it was the pineal glands. For Roger Penrose, it's the microtubules in the brain. Contra consciousness is this thing that is literally dragged in from another realm, basically. It's complete mysticism. And it fits in with the, the failure of, of a mechanical materialism to find this consciousness. And finally, you have others. Again, if you reduce, if, if the, the whole is nothing more than the sum of its parts, right? Uh, and the whole is conscious, then presumably the parts are also conscious, right? The individual neuron goes around having a little bit of a thought uh, and, uh, and you know, even the individual proteins and neurotransmitters uh, have an even smaller amount of a thought going on in their head. Uh, this is uh, obviously patent nonsense and it's, uh, it's highly respected uh, interpretation of, of consciousness referred to as integrated information theory. Again, information sounds very objective. Uh, defer to the experts. They know what they're talking about. Uh, they use complicated language. Um, but uh, yeah, for the informa integrated information th theory, consciousness is reduced to the processing of information and anything that processes information is a little bit conscious. So a barometer on the wall is a little bit conscious. A, uh, a stone is presumably a little bit conscious. Um, and a, and an even an electron would be, uh, in, a, in an atom would be a little bit conscious. Um, again, consciousness is brought in as an all permeating part of the fabric of reality. It's a descent into mysticism and idealism. Um, it's, it's complete madness and it's taken over the field, to be honest. Uh, um, and in, in fact, biannually since 1994, the University of Arizona has put on a, uh, a notorious uh, science of consciousness conference that's brought together these Nobel Prize winners and, and uh, 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 neuroscientists and philosophers to address this question. And in, and in 19, uh, sorry, in, in 2016, uh, this guy called John Horgan, who is uh, a, an occasional writer for the Scientific American and a bit of a, a bit of a cynical popular science journalist, he attended this biannual conference uh, in 2016. He'd attended the 1994 one. And what he observed when it, he, it was there, first of all, it was now sponsored by the new age quack millionaire called Deepak Chopra. Uh, you had, um, uh, you had talks on quantum consciousness, panpsychism, and you also had talks on the paranormal. Uh, you had talk, you had meditations. So there was also music in the evenings and this sort of stuff. It was uh, it was complete. It's, it's absolute degeneracy, to be honest. It's like the last days of the Roman Empire. Um, this is the this is the state that the field has uh, has fallen into, and it's the punishment that it suffered for a lack of philosophy. Um, now, to understand, to check, I am going to go a little bit over, but uh, to understand. Um, <laughs> The, the brain and, and consciousness, we, we have to see the whole in its interconnections. We have to see things dialectically uh, to address this question correctly. Um, firstly, the central nervous system is completely embedded in our body, um, as well as in, you know, in our organs and in our, uh, in our muscles. Uh, it's completely inseparable from them. And many of the emo emotions that we undoubtedly feel uh, in our, and, and, and we think about, um, are not simply electrical signals, but a whole body physiological responses to the world around us. Um, you know, we talk about feeling butterflies in our stomach or uh, when we're excited or uh, our ears burning with indignation. Um, uh, th and these are not just turns of phrase. These are entire body hormonal responses that we experience throughout our body. And our brain is, of course, embedded within that. Um, 
and it profound and, and they can profoundly of, of course affect our mental state and uh, yeah the brain far from being a simple uh, piece of electrical kit is uh, is the, the whole thing is pumped full of blood from the rest of the body it's, it cannot be separated from it it's it's bathed in uh, cerebrospinal fluid uh, it has the same hormone receptors that the rest of our body has um, and the, the cells behave uh, using uh, uh, evolutionary mechanisms that, uh, that, that that were previously used by unicellular organisms to to go about their daily lives. That synapses are believed to be um, kind of like an adaptation of a, of a former uh, uh, um, uh, property of single-celled organisms that they used to get around. That's like, that's what the synapses are kind of like reaching out. The, there's no separation, of course, between the brain and the body. It can't be reduced to some sort of uh, piece of electrical kit. And in turn, the, the, the living human individual cannot be uh, uh, separated from their social environment. Um, the brain itself, of course, co-evolved in, hum in human beings precisely with the need for abstract thought amongst this social uh, tool-making uh, hominid ancestor of ours. Um, and, and with the brain, of course, co-evolving with the brain was also co-evolving language, which we can hardly, of course, day to day, we can hardly separate language and uh, with, the, with, with abstract thought, you know, that internal monologue we have in our, in our heads. But language, of course, is not, uh, it's not um, uh, and the power of abstraction that accompanies it, it's, it's not therefore an individual, but it's, it's very much a social phenomenon. You know, a babbling baby isn't yet, you know, speaking in, uh, uh, in any particular language, but through interaction, through socialization with its parents, that babbling turns into language, as I'm sure many parents have, uh, have observed uh, with interest. And the point I'm making is that to, to study the, the brain and the mind, we have to understand them as they develop in their context. Uh, we have to understand things dialectically in evolutionary terms, um, in its historical and cultural uh, uh, and social context, and individually how the individual develops from embryology all the way up to the, the, the fully developed, fully grown human. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I, I've been told to sum up, so I will just say some final words now. So for the, yeah, I want to say a few f uh, f uh, remarks about science in general. First of all, um, it's, it's clear from everything that's, that's uh, um, you know, that's sort of been gone before that, you know, idealist trends are worming their way into the sciences and have been for over a century. And the general overarching uh, cause of this is the decay of capitalism, the fact that the ruling class are turning away from reality, the despair of that ruling class. But there are secondary causes as well. Uh, the extreme division of labor that capitalism extends into the sciences, the separation between experimental and theoretical sciences, uh, which you know, the, the division between mental and manual labor has always favored mental labor, has elevated it above manual labor and led to idealist trends and, and, and thinking. Um, but also the, the general decay within the sciences uh, themselves, the fact that you have this publish or perish kind of uh, um, uh, uh, culture, um, all of this is, having, uh, is, is also having its effect and uh, to, much to the detriment of science. But of course, most scientists, oh, you could take away from this talk that I'm trying to, you know, uh, uh, down, uh, down talk the whole of the scientists, uh, the whole of the sciences. But in actual fact, um, you know, most scientists are, 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 are very sharp thinkers and um, do very good, excellent science. And many of them are, of course, keenly aware of what is happening within the sciences. Not all of them subscribe to this nonsense that I've uh, that I've outlined uh, previously. And there are amongst them, there are those that are grasping towards materialism, and there are those that have already arrived at a conscious materialist view of the world. And we as Marxists have to make alliances with those scientists, I think. We have to reach out to them and uh, uh, win them to revolutionary Marxism, win them to our, our ideas. So I, I think the final words I want to leave to Lenin, who wrote a very short art and, and very good article, which I highly recommend comrades read, called On the Significance of Militant Materialism. And he said, in, in addition to the... Uh, in addition to the alliance with consistent materialists who do not belong to the Communist Party, of no less and perhaps even of more importance for the work which militant materialism should perform is an, is an alliance with those modern natural scientists who incline towards materialism and are not afraid to defend and preach it against the fashionable philosophical wanderings into idealism and skepticism which are prevalent in so-called educated society. So I think that's, the, that's what we've got to do. We, we can't, I think, uh, you know, like Pascal uh, Jordan, we can't just leave we can't just leave things to the, con there are conscious reactionaries who are pushing their agenda, and I'm sure comrades in some of their contributions can come in on, on some of those things, but we have to also stand up for materialism, stand up for these ideas, and we will find that there are scientists that uh, receive what we have to say very warmly, um, and will be very interested in our ideas and what we've got to say on the questions.